Good morning. If you would remain standing for just a minute as we read our text for this morning, it's going to be from Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 11, if you want to grab your Bible and follow along with me. By way of introduction, if we haven't met yet, my name is Pastor Josh Kirk. I'm the pastor of discipleship here at Grace Chapel, and it is my great honor and joy to be with you on this 4th of July weekend as we gather together from, to hear from God's Word. Follow along with me, if you would, in your, in your Bibles. In Matthew chapter 4, Matthew writes to us this. When Jesus was led up by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil, and after fasting 40 days and 40 nights, he was hungry. And the tempter came and said to him, If you are the Son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. But he answered, It is written, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, If you are the Son of God, throw yourself down, for it is written, He will command his angels concerning you and On their hands they will bear you up, lest you strike your foot against the stone. And Jesus said to him, Again it is written, You shall not put the Lord your God to the test. Again the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, All these I will give you, if you will fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, Be gone, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. Then the devil left him, and behold, angels came and were ministering to him. You can be seated. Father, we gather here this morning to hear from you. We know that you are a good and gracious God. And so, Lord, we humbly ask, speak to us this morning. Encourage our hearts, convict us of your truth, and help us to leave our service today a little bit changed, a little bit more like you. We ask these things in your precious and holy name. Amen. A number of years ago, my family decided to go on vacation. And this was a very special vacation because we decided to go on vacation with some good friends of ours. Tim and Haley O'Day. They are friends that we had come to know and love when I was in college, and they have kids around our age. And we decided that we were going to go to Disneyland together. And so one February, we packed all the kids up, and we drove to Utah, met up with them, and then we all drove out to Anaheim, California, and took our kids to Disneyland together. And I don't know if You've ever been to Disneyland or Disney World with kids or any theme park whatsoever. But there comes a moment, usually around two or three o'clock in the afternoon, where the parents are getting tired and the children are getting hungry, even though they just had a snack 30 minutes ago. And at this point in our lives, both the O'Day family and the Kirk family had infants they were nursing. And so... I remember this moment in time when we are sitting together and we're trying to catch our breath and the kids are starting to complain and there's friction there and the infants are starting to cry and so there's friction there and we're all kind of getting hot and tired and so there's friction there and it's the pressure just seems to be building and building and building. And then my friend Tim said something that I will always remember. He just took a deep breath and he said, isn't the Lord good to us? You know, most people don't get to come to Disneyland with their friends on vacation. This has been so fun. It's for the most part cool. A lot of the lines are short. We get to eat good snacks. And he just starts recounting all the ways that the Lord has been good to us so far. And at first, You know, my heart was maybe a little indignant, like, why are you bringing this Jesus talk into my suffering? But on the second breath, I realized, no, he's right. 
And that moment stuck with me because it was a microcosm for how we deal with temptation. And when my good friend Tim said, hey, isn't the Lord good to us? It's almost like somebody took the lid off the tea kettle and let all the pressure out. And we were able to breathe and start to have fun again. And this moment where he paused and remembered the Lord's goodness sets forth for us a pattern of responding to temptation. A pattern which I think our text clearly shows us in Matthew chapter 4. Because as much as we hate to admit it, friends, we all get to that point, right? Now I'm not talking about the point in Disneyland with tired and hungry kids. I'm talking about the point where the pressures in life are squeezing our hearts. And we start to think things that we normally wouldn't attribute to good Christian thoughts, right? We start thinking, what are we doing here? Why did God put me in this place? Where is he? Has he forgotten me? Does he remember me? Is he being good to me right now? Whether it's the circumstances of life or our own desires at play, we all reach this point where we're tempted to give in to suffering and grumble or complain or chase our sinful desires. So what do we do? How do we overcome the temptation which faces us all? This is our topic for this morning. We're going to look at three keys to overcoming temptation. And we're going to look at how Jesus responded to his temptation from Matthew chapter 4. So if you're following along, I have three points for you, like any good preacher, right? Three points to overcoming temptation. If we're going to overcome temptation, we must do these three things. We must cling to God's goodness. We must remember God's greatness. And we must keep first things first. Cling to God's goodness. Remember God's greatness. Keep first things first. Let's look at our text together in Matthew chapter 4. Matthew starts, introduces us to our story at hand. Then Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. First, a couple notes of context here that will elucidate the story for us. Number one, we should notice this is happening right after Jesus was baptized. Jesus was baptized by John in the Jordan, and Matthew tells us that they heard a voice from heaven, that is God the Father, proclaiming, this is my beloved son with whom I am well pleased. And so Jesus immediately after that is then led, it says, by the Spirit. Jesus didn't just wander into temptation. He was led there by the Spirit. Now, the scriptures are clear. God does not tempt us. He is not tempted and he tempts no one. But he does lead us into difficult places where temptation happens. In the context of this chapter, it was the wilderness. Now, we would all love to always be led by still waters and green pastures, right? But sometimes the Lord doesn't lead us that way. He sometimes leads us through the valley of the shadow of death into the wilderness of suffering where our hearts are truly shown. Notice also the time here. Matthew specifically points out that he was fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, this is significant because 40 days and 40 nights is about the limit of what the human body can handle before it starts to suffer permanent damage from lack of nutrition. Jesus is pushing the envelope here, fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. The number here is also significant. There was another son of God who was led for 40-somethings, right? Israel was led through the wilderness for 40 years before they entered into the promised land. We'll see the significance of this pop up here in just a minute. 
Finally, notice, it's not some peon newbie bringing temptation. It's Satan himself, the father of lies, who was there at the beginning, is here to tempt Jesus. And so we know these temptations are going to be epic. So this first temptation, Satan comes and says to him, if you are the son of God, command these stones to become loaves of bread. Do you hear that? If you are the son of God? Can you hear that doubt there? Here's the master tempter again. The father of lies doing the same thing that he did in the garden. Did God actually say, right? Are you actually who you say you are? So command these stones to become bread. We look at that and we say, well, what's wrong with a little bread, right? Jesus is hungry. He's obviously got the power to command these stones to become bread. And at first we might think, well, I don't know, but it's got to be bad because Satan's asking him to do it, right? Those good sourdough loaves that Jesus is about to make from those stones are liable to turn into deviled eggs or something, right? Heavens no. <clears throat> but it goes deeper than this, right? It's wrong. This would have been sin for Jesus because it would have been tantamount to saying God is a bad father. Jesus and his response here actually is quoting from a sermon that Moses gave to the Israelites who themselves had been wandering around in the desert for 40 years. Deuteronomy chapter 8, which is where Jesus is quoting from, says this. This is Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 2 and 3. And you shall remember the whole way that the Lord your God has led you these 40 years in the wilderness, that he might humble you, testing you to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. And he humbled you and let you hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, that he might make you to know that man does not live by bread alone, but man lives by every word that comes from the mouth of God." Just as God led Israel into the wilderness to show what was in their heart and to humble them and along the way provide in some miraculous ways, here again is God leading his only begotten son, Jesus, into the wilderness to be humbled. And along the way, he is going to provide in miraculous ways. Jesus making bread for himself here would have been a demonstration that he didn't trust God's goodness. He would have been doing what Israel did back in the promised land. Have you led us out here to die? Why haven't you given us what we wanted? Satan was saying, hey, you've been wandering out here for a long time now. Don't you want some food? It seems like maybe... God's just forgotten you were out here. He promised he was going to provide, but here you are at death's door and still no provision. Does God really care for you? Because it seems he's let you out here to die. He's, he's tricked you. Have you ever been there? Have you ever been to that place where you too doubted God's word or doubted his goodness? Maybe you thought to yourself, Does God even know me? Does he hear me? Is this whole faithfulness through suffering gig worth it? Why would God allow this to happen? He said if I obey, he would bring blessing, but that hasn't turned out. Maybe the person you thought you married doesn't really exist, and you feel tricked into a life of drudgery and pain. Maybe you raised your kids in a certain way, and now they've left the faith. Maybe you worked hard at your job and were still the one to be let go. Despite your faithfulness and sacrifice, your spouse leaves. A loved one gets sick and is taken from you, no matter the heartfelt prayers and the crying out to the Lord. The pressures of life's hardships ramp up and these meet with unmet expectations. What happens to your faith then? Where does your heart go? 
Well, Jesus models for us here where it should go. He responds to doubts of God's word and his goodness with scripture. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. Jesus knows what's most important for him is not food. It's not relief. It's not escape. He doesn't need a period of me time and self-care after all of this holy fasting. What he needs is his heavenly father. He needs to obey So Jesus resists the devil and chooses to believe that God is a good father who has his best interests at heart. He's not leading him out here in the wilderness to die, but to do something good, to be humbled, to learn obedience. So he responds with faith, believing that God is who he said he is and that he is capable of doing all that he's promised. Herein lies the key to overcoming temptation. We cling to God's goodness. Jesus trusted his good and loving father, and we should too. So how? How do we do this? In the midst of temptation, how do we cling to God's goodness? Let me give you a couple ways. Number one, in the midst of temptation, you need to be living in community where people can speak of God's faithfulness. You need people like my good friend, Tim O'Day, who can take a deep breath and pause and say, remember how the Lord is good to us. Not everybody gets these opportunities. Isn't he good? It lifts our gaze upward to look to God's goodness. We oftentimes can't do that by ourselves. We need our brothers and sisters beside us who say, yeah, I know this is hard, but look over here. I know this is hard, but remember God. Here's the second thing that you can do. Meditate on the proof of God's love for you. That is his only son. Friends, you and I sometimes treat the gift of Christ too lightly. We forget that was God's one and only son whose blood was shed for you and for me. If you want proof of God's goodness to you, the first thing you do is you look to Jesus and you remember his blood shed on our behalf. So when we meet with temptation, we cling to God's goodness. Here's the second thing. When we meet with temptation, we remember God's greatness. Look back at our text. Matthew says, then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the pinnacle of the temple and said to him, if you are the son of God, throw yourself down for it is written. He will command his angels concerning you and on their hands, they will bear you up lest you strike your foot against the stone. This seems like an odd thing to do, right? Why, why throw yourself off the temple? Well, remember Jesus has lived 30 years in obscurity. We have almost nothing about Jesus' life up to this point. We have one or two stories at the beginning of Matthew and a couple stories in Luke that shed a little glimpse on his childhood. But up to this point, Jesus has been basically unknown. And so here's Satan saying, hey, you know, I don't, I don't know if God's really remembered you. He's made you a lot of promises, but none of them have come true yet. Maybe he's indeed led you out here to die just like the Israelites. So go ahead, throw yourself off. Prove that God loves you. If you're the chair's son, he's not going to allow you to fail. He'll rescue you at the last minute. This temptation is really about putting God to the test as we see in Jesus' response. He says to him, again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. This is about manipulating God based on his promises to back him into a corner so he has to do something that we want. Prove your love to us. Prove your faithfulness. Prove that you are who you said you are, even though he's done such things again and again and again. Now, most of us haven't been tempted to 
throw ourselves off a bridge or jump from a high building and say, God, if you love me, you'll catch me, right? <clears throat> That's not most of our experiences. But there are other ways that we've hinted at already that we can test God. Here's two in particular that I think are relevant for you and I today. Number one, we put God to the test when we insist he prove his faithfulness to us. Again, we've seen his faithfulness in the past. First in that, he gave his one and only son for us as a ransom for our sins. And he's given us many blessings on top of those things. We can also look forward to future promises of blessing like deliverance from sin and life forever and fellowship with God in the new heavens and new earth. However, when difficulties come into the present, we can be just like the Israelites, beginning to doubt whether God is really there or not, despite his proven track record. We say things like, how could a loving God do this? Maybe when things get better, I'll be able to trust him. We allow our present difficulties to determine how we view God instead of letting what we know to be true about God color how we view our circumstances. But there's another way we put God to the test. We put God to the test when we presume upon his grace. Let me explain what this means. We presume upon God's grace when we treat his commands as no big deal. When we think about sin and we say, well, it's not that bad, right? Lots of other people do this. And even if it's not exactly what God would want, he'll forgive me, right? He's already paid the price. It's an infinite cost. And so there's an infinite treasury to draw from. Friends, when we justify our sin by minimizing or resting on forgiveness later, giving in and taking the easy way out so we don't have to fight as hard, we are putting the Lord to the test. We are sinning with a high hand. And it's not just sins of commission. It's sins of omission. It's the things we know we should do, but don't do. We can treat his word as if it's optional or only for the super obedient Christians, right? That's only for the pastors and their family. That doesn't really apply to regular Christians like us. But friends, when we do that, we're taking a lackadaisical attitude toward, towards personal holiness and making a mockery of God's commands and his grace. A Christian philosopher in the 1900s told an allegory about this. He said, it's as if a king issues a decree, but instead of doing what the king commands, his people begin to interpret it. One person publishes an interpretation, then another. Every day, new interpretations are broadcast. I think this is what the king meant. Well, I think that. Well, anyway, we don't really need to do anything about it. And so no one acts so as to do what the king commands. Friends, in this way, we sit above the word and not under it. We discuss, we interpret, we think together, but we never get around to submitting to it. If you doubt me, just think about our typical Sunday morning experience. We come in, we gather together for worship, we hear the word preached by Pastor Josh or Pastor Josh or another guest preacher, <clears throat> and we walk out of here thinking, oh man, that was so convicting. But by Monday morning, we've basically totally forgotten what was so convicting about that sermon. And that's if you're lucky, right? When I have Sunday evening meal with my family, I like to ask, what did you guys learn in church today? And the answers I sometimes get are basically incoherent, right? <clears throat> We've already forgotten by the evening what we thought was so spectacular that morning. Friends, when we do that, 
we're not taking God's word seriously. We're thinking about it. We like hearing about it. We like discussing it. But we don't often, or at least as much as we'd like to think, find ourselves submitting to it. We think the call to leave everything and follow Jesus can somehow leave our lives unchanged, as if Jesus can simply be something we add on to our routines, and any intentional act of obedience are radical, extra things, instead of the bare essentials of discipleship and following Jesus. A German pastor warned the church in Germany of this during World War II. His name was Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and he talks about this spirit of the age, and he coined this cheap grace. He said, cheap grace is justification of sin, but not justification of the contrite sinner who turns away from sin and repents. It is not forgiveness of sin which separates those who sinned from sin. Cheap grace is that grace which we bestow upon ourselves. It is preaching forgiveness without repentance. It is baptism without discipline. It is the Lord's Supper without confession of sin. It is absolution without personal confession. Cheap grace is grace without discipleship, grace without the cross, grace without the living incarnate Jesus Christ. You see, friends, this cheap grace doesn't call us to separate ourselves from the world in any meaningful way. In fact, it makes no demands at all. It just says, come as you are, receive forgiveness of sin, but leaves us unchanged. Friends, God's grace is freely offered, but it is not cheap. It cost God his very own son to redeem us. And what has cost God his son must never be regarded as cheap wares to be thrown about. When we water down the expectations Christ gives for those who follow them and make them out to be special marks of obedience, we are throwing away the king's commands. We are testing God. So how do we fight this temptation to test God? Well, we do it by remembering his greatness. Last week, Pastor Josh Wyman concluded a series through Amos, and he was recapping some of the lessons that Israel should have learned. And one of the things he said was, they forgot who they were dealing with. Friends, we often forget who we are dealing with. Yes, God is Father, but He is the Almighty Father, the maker of heaven and earth, and He is holy, holy, holy. He offers you forgiveness, but He will by no means clear the guilty. We can think about what this should cause in our hearts by thinking about a good earthly father, right? I will never forget a time in my childhood when I had mouthed off to my mother and my dad grabbed me by the arm and drug me into his bedroom where we did all of our loving discipline. And he looked at me in the eye and he said, Don't you ever talk to my wife like that again. And then he gave me the Lord's grace in the form of discipline on my backside. But you know, I've never forgotten that moment, and I never talked to my mom like that again. It wasn't just because I knew spankings were coming, but because I knew that was a line that I dare not cross. My father was loving He was good, but there were going to be consequences for my sin, both corporal and relational. And so I didn't do that again. That's 
a little bit of an inkling of what it's like for us to fear our heavenly father, right? This is what the Bible terms as fear of the Lord. It's a reverent awe of God and a respect for his rules. So if we're going to resist temptation and not tempt God, we want to cultivate this attitude. And we do that by meditating on his characteristics and attributes. We want to know this God, just like you would know and cultivate a relationship with our earthly fathers. The more we know and love and respect them, the more reverential fear and awe is in our hearts. Here's the second thing. We pursue humility by being mindful of our own desperate wickedness and the price paid to rescue you out of it. Friends, when we sin, we ought not think, ah, Jesus died for that. We ought to think Jesus had to die for that. Your sin, my sin was so bad, somebody had to die. Should have been you. It can be you. But God shows his love for us by offering a ransom in our place. Jesus Christ the righteous, who lived the life you and I couldn't and then died the death that you and I deserved and then rose again on the third day to prove that he was who he said and that he could do for us all the things that he's promised. And he says, if you'll come and turn from your sin and rest in me, I will save you. So we meditate on God's characteristics and attributes. We pursue humility by being mindful of our own sinfulness and the cost it That was paid to redeem us. And we pursue life and community with one another. You need people in your life who know you and will speak the truth to you. Who will say, friend, you're treating God's commands too lightly here. You are not following in obedience. Sin is seductive and subtle. Many times there are currents in our own hearts that we're not aware of. And so we need brothers and sisters who will encourage us and speak the truth. So we resist and overcome temptation by clinging to the Lord's goodness. We remember the Lord's greatness, cultivating the fear of the Lord. Here's the third thing from our text. We keep first things first. Matthew continues... And again, the devil took him to a very high mountain and showed him all the kingdoms of the world and their glory. And he said to him, all these I will give you if you fall down and worship me. Then Jesus said to him, be gone, for it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. Satan is coming to Jesus and offering something that God has actually already promised Jesus. He's promised that he would one day reconcile all things to himself, that he would lay all his enemies as a footstool under his feet. The kingdom for Jesus is assured. But here's Satan offering an easier way. Right? He's saying, hey, you don't have to do this whole living and trying to teach these dense fishermen You don't have to really do the whole cross thing. You can get everything you want right now the easy way if you just bow down and show me a little worship. I'm not asking for lots of worship, right? Just a a little compromise. Jesus here is being tempted to set up his own kingdom, to take what rightfully belongs to him instead of trusting God to come through on his promise. Whose kingdom is Jesus going to live for? Is he going to choose his own or is he going to submit to God? Jesus responds here again, quoting the Old Testament, reminds us that these sorts of choices always involve worship and service. Notice his response. You shall worship the Lord and him only shall you serve. These two, service and worship, always go together. 
Whatever it is that we worship, that's what we will serve. And while we give our, the best of our time, attention, our mental energy, and financial resources, that's what we serve. Whatever we think about most, get upset at when it's threatened, that's what we worship. That's what we truly serve. You and I probably won't get an offer directly from Satan, like Jesus did, but we all struggle with this compromise, with worship gone awry. The prophet Jeremiah wrote this in chapter 2, verses 11 and 13. Has a nation changed its gods, even though there are no gods? But my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Be appalled, O heavens, at this. Be shocked. Be utterly desolate, declares the Lord. For my people have committed two evils. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living waters, and hewed out cisterns for themselves, broken cisterns that can hold no water. Friends, you and I are always drinking from cisterns. We're always worshiping something. And whatever that is, it's going to be at the center of your heart, directing your thoughts, feelings, and actions. It can be Jesus, but it is often something else. In this light, every choice that you and I make is a worship choice. Are you going to act in accordance with what you know to be true, or are you going to act according to how you feel in the moment? Are you going to submit to God and trust in his goodness, or are you going to choose your own way? Are you going to live for Christ or live for yourself? There is no middle ground here, friends. Jesus trusted his father that he is good and that he does good. He chose to live for the everlasting kingdom that will have no end, not a temporary one Satan could deliver. Jesus kept first things first. God was always front and center. And that led to Jesus resisting temptation and clinging to the Lord. So how do we do this? How do we keep first things first? How do we strive against the sin that so easily entangles us? How do we recognize those currents, those desires, those idols that so subtly sneak into our hearts? Well, you can practice some godly self-examination here. Let me give you some questions that can prompt you as you go through your day thinking about this. Ask yourself this, what do you love? Is there something you love more than God or neighbor? What do you want? What do you desire? What do you crave? What do you long for, wish? Whose desires do you obey? Here's another question, what do you seek? What are your personal expectations and goals? What are your intentions? What are you working for? Question number four, where do you bank your hope? What hope are you working toward or building your life around? Here's one that I often find myself asking in my counseling room. What do you fear? You see, flee fear is the flip side of desire. For example, if you desire acceptance, you will fear rejection. What do you fear? Is it the Lord or is it something else? What do you feel like doing? This is synonymous for desire, right? When I get done with my church responsibilities for the day, I like to go home and I feel like taking a nap, right? Maybe you feel like eating a bowl of ice cream in the evening. These things are desires which show something about what is going on in your heart. And they can tell us, they serve as barometers. Are we with Christ or are we living with something else? Here's the third thing, and I've already mentioned it in my other two points. Live together in community. Hebrews 3.13 says this, Exhort one another every day as long as it is still called today so that none of you may be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. Sin is deceitful. It's subtle. There are currents in our own hearts we don't often understand. We need 
our brothers and sisters in Christ to be living alongside us, to actually know us, to be able to say, hey, good job. Or friend, you need to watch out. Or I know this is hard, but remember the Lord's goodness. God made us for community, for relationship. The fact that we're not able to do this on our own is not proof that something is wrong. It's proof that something is right. God made us to need one another. So if we're going to resist temptation, we need to embrace that fact that God made us to know and to be known. This story of Jesus' temptation recounts for us and demonstrates how Jesus, the perfect man, overcomes temptation. He clings to God's goodness. He remembers God's greatness. And he kept first things first. We've seen how challenging some of those things can be. And we've noticed that this is why God made the church for us. We're about to end here our formal time in our worship service. But I encourage you, don't just run out. If you think, okay, Pastor Josh, how can I start practicing this today? Here's what I'll tell you. Before you go, grab someone and ask how you can pray for them. And then when they start to tell you, actually listen, right? Don't just say, okay, I'll pray for that. And then rush out and hope you get around to praying for that later sometime in the week. Listen to the stories and then pray right there for them in the pew or the aisles or in the parking lot or as you're getting coffee, maybe next week because I think we're already done with coffee for the morning. But grab somebody and ask how you can pray for them. Enter into the potentially difficult things someone might share with you. Pray that the Lord would enlarge their heart with faith to trust in his goodness. Pray that the Lord would show them through his word and through interactions with other people, his glory so that they can be amazed and cultivate the fear of the Lord. Pray that they would be intentional about keeping Jesus at the center, keeping first things first. And if somebody asks how they can pray for you, I encourage you to tell them. Share with them something that maybe you haven't shared before, something hard that's going on in your life. It's a way for you to practice humility and for you to signal that you also are in need of help and care. Let me pray for us this morning. Father, we are grateful for your son, Jesus. We are grateful that he fasted and suffered temptation in the wilderness for us, that he was righteous for us because we can't be. We're thankful that he paid the price for our weakness and sin. Lord, I ask this week that you would be with us, that your word would follow us home this morning, that your spirit would convict our hearts and enlarge our faith. Lord, we ask all these things in your precious holy name. Amen.